గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఆస్పిరెన్స్ వెల్కమ్ టు ది హిందీ న్యూస్ అనాలిసిస్ బాయ్ శంకర్ ఐఎస్ అకాడమీ ఫర్ ది డేట్ ట్వంటీ ఫోర్త్ ఆఫ్ ఏప్రిల్ టూ థౌసండ్ ట్వంటీ వన్ దీస్ ఆర్ ది లిస్ట్ ఆఫ్ న్యూస్ ఆర్టికల్స్ టేకన్ ఫర్ టుడేస్ అనాలిసిస్ దే హీన్ ప్రొవైడెడ్ అలాంగ్ విత్ ది పేజ్ నెంబర్స్ ఆఫ్ డిఫరెంట్ ఎడిషన్స్ ఆఫ్ హిందీ న్యూస్ పేపర్ ది లింక్ ఫర్ ది హ్యాండ్ రిటర్ నోట్స్ ఇన్ ది పీడిఎఫ్ ఫార్మాట్ అండ్ ది టైమ్ స్టాంపింగ్ ఫర్ ది డిస్ప్లేట్ ఆర్టికల్స్ విల్ బి ప్రొవైడెడ్ ఇన్ ది డిస్క్రిప్షన్ బాక్స్ అండ్ ఆల్సో ఇన్ ది కమెంట్ సెక్షన్ ఆఫ్టర్ ది ఎండ్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ సెషన్ నౌ లెట్ అస్ స్టార్ట్ అవర్ అనాలిసిస్ నౌ దిస్ డిస్కషన్ ఇస్ బేస్డ్ ఆన్ దిస్ న్యూస్ ఆర్టికల్ విచ్ మెన్షన్స్ దాట్ ఇండియన్ రూపీ హెస్ లాస్ట్ టూ పాయింట్ సిక్స్ పర్సెంటేజ్ అగేన్స్ ది డాలర్ దిస్ మంత్ సి ఇండియన్ రూపీ హెస్ పీక్ డెట్ సెవెంటీ ఫైవ్ పాయింట్ జీరో వన్ రూపీస్ టు ది డాలర్ అండ్ ఇట్ ఇస్ ఎక్స్పెక్టెడ్ టు స్టే ఇన్ దిస్ సెవెంటీ ఫోర్ And the fact to be noted here is that this month saw the highest depreciation of our currency since the pandemic hit the country last year. So based on this, the news article mentions that now it is in the hands of RBI to prevent any further depreciation of rupee. So in this context, let us see about currency depreciation, reasons for it, its impact on the economy and we'll also see how it can be controlled. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See, before knowing about currency depreciation, we should know about currency exchange rate. Currency exchange rate refers to the value of one currency with respect to another currency. For example, it is the value of Indian rupee to the US dollar. So now what is currency depreciation? It means fall in the value of domestic currency against foreign currency. This means domestic currency can buy less units of foreign currency than earlier. For example, suppose today INR is trading at rupees 71 per USD against yesterday's closing of rupees 70 per USD. So what this means? It means INR has depreciated by rupees 1 per USD. In other words, for purchasing 1 dollar, now the trader has to pay 1 rupee more. Previously the trader paid only 70 rupees and now the trader has to pay 71 rupees. Here you should also know about currency appreciation. It means increase in value of domestic currency against a foreign currency. In simple words, when currency appreciates, we can buy more units of foreign currency than earlier. For example, suppose today Indian INR is trading at rupees 69 per USD against yesterday's closing of rupees 70 per USD. This means INR has appreciated by rupees 1 per USD. That means for purchasing 1 USD, the trader has to pay 1 rupee less. Why? Because yesterday the trader had to pay 70 rupees and today the trader has to pay only 69 rupees. So this means currency has appreciated. Now in our discussion, let's concentrate on currency depreciation. This will automatically help us to understand about currency appreciation also. Now, you might have a question that who fixes the value of Indian rupee against US dollar? Is it the Indian government or the RBI? None of them actually. At present, none of these entities fixes the value of Indian rupee. Rather, the value of Indian rupee is determined by the market. And when we say market, it means the currency market. See, the demand and supply forces in the currency market determine the price of each currency. If the demand for Indian currency is high, then Indian rupee will appreciate. Like it will be rupees 40 for 1 dollars. And then if demand is low, then rupee will depreciate. For example, for 1 dollar, rupee will be rupees 70. So now if market forces determine the value of a currency, then that type of system is called as floating rate system. And India has adopted the partial floating rate system since 1975. And from the year 1993, India has been fully dependent on the floating rate system itself. See, the other type of system is the fixed rate system. When a government or the central bank fixes the exchange rate of a currency and they does not allow any variation according to the demand and supply forces in the market, then such a system is called as the fixed rate system. It is also called as the Bretton Woods system or pegged currency system. So India was following this kind of system till 1975. That is until the partial floating rate system was followed. And then from 1993, India followed floating rate system fully. So here you should know that the major factor in deciding currency price is the demand and supply for countries currency in the international forex market. And here the demand and supply dynamics are influenced by many factors like inflation, global trades, interest rates fluctuation, central banks and governments intervention, external borrowings and geopolitical stability etc. Apart from these, the level of confidence in the economy of a particular country also influences the currency of that country. So now let us understand some of these factors deeply. 
the first factor is when inflation takes place in the economy at this time the indian commodities become more expensive and therefore they become less competitive hence the demand for indian exports will decline and this will adversely impact the demand of indian rupee in the foreign exchange market additionally the indian consumers would find foreign goods more attractive because they would be cheaper and hence the demand for foreign currencies in the foreign exchange market would go up and hence due to inflation in the economy the value of rupee would depreciate now the second factor is regarding the current account deficit see it takes place when the import bill is greater than the export bill now this leads to an adverse balance of payments and this implies that india would have to pay more foreign exchange than what it will earn as a result of this india's demand for foreign currency would increase and thereby it leads to the depreciation of indian rupee itself now the third factor is the political instability in the country this leads to foreign investors losing their confidence in the investment potential of the country and hence they pull out from the indian market that is they stop investing and because of this the country loses out on its foreign exchange which again leads to rupee depreciation the fourth factor is similar to this when the foreign institutional investors decide to sell off their shares in bulk and they also pull out their funds from the market at this time the indian stock market falls and hence the value of rupee falls now fifth factor is when the world faces a global crisis in the form of wars economic crises or pandemics like that of what we are facing now now this leads to economic instability across countries so this in turn affects the value of rupee also so these are some of the factors that lead to currency depreciation now what are the impacts of currency depreciation first impact is that currency depreciation can help countries to improve their trade balance let us take an example to understand this assume that indians imported only iphones and indians exported only shirts so a fall in rupee would make our imports more expensive because indians would be paying more in rupee terms for the unchanged dollar price of that iphone and similarly an american retailer who is importing shirts from india would be able to get more shirts for the same expenditure in dollars so because of this the american retailer would reroute more of his orders to india because the retailer is getting more product for the same expenditure so this will lead to a rise in demand for indian products and thus it will lead to rise in indian exports so every time when there is a fall in rupee against us dollars exporters from india are benefited but on the other hand indian importers are adversely affected for example a large proportion of india's imports are composed of oil and gold as much as 35% of india's import bill is owed to oil from the middle east itself so when the value of rupee falls the import of oil also goes up for the general public in india now other than this there is another negative impact of currency depreciation which is that there will be more burden on the government with respect to subsidies then another negative impact is that when imports become expensive and exports become cheaper the gap in the balance of payments increases so this widens the capital account deficit but other than these negative impacts depreciation has other advantages mainly it benefits nris so we know that there are plenty of nris who live in other countries but they have their families back home in india so when the value of rupee falls the amount of money which they send to india also increases that is the remittances by them increases let us take an example if an nri sends 100 us dollars at a time when the conversion of 1 us dollar was at rupee 62.5 so the amount which the nri sent was equivalent to rupees 6250 but if the nri sends the same amount at a time when the rupee has depreciated to 75 rupees that means the conversion for 1 us dollar is equivalent to 75 rupees then at this time the total amount which the nri sent will be equal to 7500 rupees see at the side of nri she is sending the same amount of money only but since the indian rupee is fluctuating the amount received is different in value hence fall in the value of rupee leads to greater benefit for nris and their families who are living in india so their consumption will increase which in turn will contribute to boosting the economy apart from this a fall in the price of rupee also turns fruitful for the tourism industry because more foreigners will come to india for holiday as it is cheaper for them so these are the implications of rupee depreciation 
Now, how can rupee depreciation be controlled? See, some of the measures for this include improving the climate for foreign investors because when there will be more investments, Indian rupee will appreciate. Then another measure could be making government bonds available to a wider investor base. This will also lead to more investments. Then RBI can take measures like deregulation of interest rates on deposits from NRIs. Then measures could be introduced to curb speculative trading, which will not lead to sudden fall of uh, share market, etc. So these are some of the measures that can be taken to improve the rupee. So that is all about this discussion. In this discussion, we focused on rupee depreciation, the reasons behind it, its implications, and finally, we also saw how it can be controlled. So now let us move on to the next discussion. This discussion is based on these two news articles, which talk about the reopening of Vedanta's Sterlight Copper Plant in Tamil Nadu. See, the Tamil Nadu government was asked by the central government to reopen this plant for producing medical oxygen. But Tamil Nadu objected to this. So this news article mentions that the Chief Justice of India has pushed for the reopening of this plant for producing medical oxygen. And this news article talks about the reaction of the public on this matter. So in today's discussion, let us see this issue in detail. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See, the ongoing second wave of COVID-19 is witnessing a serious increase in cases and this has increased the demand for medical oxygen. So first, why COVID-19 patients need oxygen support? See, the coronavirus affects the patient's respiratory system and their epithelial cells. Here, epithelial cells are the cells that come from the surfaces of our body, such as skin, blood vessels, urinary tract or organs. And they serve as a barrier between the inside and outside of our body and they protect us from viruses. But this coronavirus affects these epithelial cells itself. So to fight such an infection, the body's immune system releases the cells that triggers inflammation. Now such continued inflammatory immune response by the body to the coronavirus delays the regular transfer of oxygen in the lungs. Now this causes difficulty in breathing and it leads to oxygen requirement. So now let us come to the main issue of sterlite copper plant in Tamil Nadu. See, it was one of the India's largest copper producing factory. It is owned by England based company called Vedanta Limited. And in Tamil Nadu, this plant is situated in the Tutukorin district. But this project was shut down in the year 2018. So why was it shut down? See, the project had been facing opposition for nearly two decades due to its environmental concerns. But the opposition to this plant intensified when the company announced the expansion of this plant to double its annual production from 0.4 million tons to 0.8 million tons. And this announcement caused widespread uh, protests that resulted in police crackdown where 13 people were killed in police firing. So following this mishappening, the electric city and water supply to the plant was disconnected and then the plant was sealed and its permanent closure was announced by the district collector in May 2018. And this particular decision was taken based on an order by the Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board. And this board blamed Sterlite Copper Plant for causing groundwater pollution and also based on the widespread protest by the people. So what were all the major accusations? See, one of the major accusations is that the smelter was polluting groundwater and this affected the health and environment of nearby residents. See, remember, copper smelting causes air pollution, water pollution and land pollution. This is because the smelting process releases sulfur dioxide gas in the air and this causes respiratory ailments. And this process also releases red on iron, manganese, lead, arsenic, nitrates and fluorides. And these elements reach the water sources and the soil through the industrial slag. See, slag is nothing but the stony waste matter that is separated from metals during the smelting process. So these elements pollute the water sources and the soil. Now, apart from pollution and the usual contamination in the smelting process, the plant also had seen uh, 27 industrial accidents and gas leaks between the years 1997 to 2013. So based on these reasons, people were protesting for closing of the plant and the decision was finally taken by the Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board, which was finally implemented by the district collector. Now you may ask why this plant was kept 
open even though it had these many disadvantages it is because the plant produced 36% of the copper used in india so that means the shutdown of the plant has impacted the copper industry of our country and it has also affected many manufacturing industries as well that depend on copper industry so even though there are such advantages we cannot deny that it has adverse impacts on the health of the people and environment but how this plant is related to oxygen production see this sterling copper unit in tutukudi of tamil nadu has two oxygen producing plants and these oxygen plants were used to support the combustion in the smelter process but this was also closed in may 2018 so what is the present scenario see the copper smelter unit and its oxygen plants remain idle since its closure in may 2018 and in the recent times both the center and the state governments are facing shortages in medical oxygen So in this backdrop the CEO of the Sterlite plant submitted an appeal to the state government and the CEO sought permission to operate the plant only for oxygen production the CEO also promised that oxygen will be supplied free of cost and noted that it can supply around 1050 tons of oxygen per day to the hospitals and this is a huge amount at a time when we are facing oxygen shortages but Tamil Nadu government did not allow so the company also approached the supreme court with its offer and based on this the central government supported this move but this has been opposed by the tamil nadu government rather the tamil nadu government asked the administration of the district to conduct a public hearing on the issue and to send its report on april 23rd that is yesterday this was because tamil nadu government wanted to submit an affidavit before the supreme court based on the opinions of the public so as per the instructions the district administration invited selected people both in favor of and against the move to resume operations for oxygen production and in the public hearing majority of the participants opposed sterlite's plea for resumption of its operation they cited that there is no scarcity of uh, medical oxygen in tamil nadu and therefore the plant must remain closed see this is mainly because the people fear that allowing such operations could eventually lead to full scale resumption of activities at the sterlite copper in the future and this notion is also supported by the tamil nadu government but however supreme court and the chief justice of india is against this notion because the country is in bad need of oxygen so the supreme court has cited that constitution demands for material resources to be distributed equally throughout the country and thus tamil nadu government should resume operations of sterlite copper plant for oxygen production only so now let us wait and see what decision is taken by the tamil nadu government so these are some of the points that you should know about this issue regarding sterlite copper plant in tamil nadu now let's move on to the next discussion our next discussion is based on this news article which is with reference to heavy rain accompanied by hailstones which were reported in some parts of bengaluru so in this context let us have a brief understanding about hailstones and their formation see hail is a type of precipitation hail is formed when drops of water freeze together in the cold upper regions of thunderstorm clouds most hailstones measure between 5 mm and 15 cm in diameter and they can be round in shape or even jagged or spiked But remember that hailstones are not frozen raindrops frozen rain falls as water and then it freezes as it nears the ground but hail actually falls as a solid only so how are these hailstones formed they are formed by layers of water that attach and freeze in a large cloud a frozen droplet begins to fall from a cloud during a storm but it is pushed back up into the cloud by a strong updraft of wind so when the hailstone is lifted it hits liquid water droplets and those droplets then freeze on the hailstone that is on its surface and thus they add another layer to that hailstone and these hailstones eventually falls to earth when it becomes too heavy to remain in the cloud or they fall when the updraft stops or when it slows down now know that there are different types of hailstones the first is soft hail or uh, it is also known as snow pellets these are white opaque rounded or conical pellets and they are as large as 6 mm in diameter they have a low density and they can be readily crushed now the second type is the small hail they are transparent or translucent pellets of ice and they have diameters of a few millimeters now the third one is the true hailstone they are hard pellets of ice and they are larger than 5 mm in diameter now they may be of uh, different shapes they often have structures of concentric layers of alternately clear and opaque ice as you can see in this image 
and you know that a moderately severe storm may produce hailstones a few centimeters in diameter whereas a very severe storm may release stones with a maximum diameter of 10 cm or more and know that large damaging hails fall most frequently in the continental areas of middle latitudes uh, like the USA and the northern India but it is rare in the equatorial region now these hailstones can cause extreme damage to people it can damage buildings vehicles and even crops so people have tried many ways to prevent hail and interestingly in the 18th century it is said that europeans began trying to prevent hail by firing cannons into the clouds and also by ringing church bells but still it couldn't be prevented so these are the points that you should know about hailstones now let's move on to the next discussion our next discussion is based on this news article which mentions that customs officials at chennai airport have seized cut leaves that are worth more than 1 crore rupees and they have seized these leaves under the narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act of 1985 so first let us see about the cut leaves then we'll also see about this ndps act see cut leaves is scientifically known as kata edulis it is a stimulant drug that is made from the leaves and twigs of an evergreen shrub this evergreen shrub is mainly cultivated in east africa and south yemen now there are also other names to this cut leaves they are mira cut or arabian tea and abyssinian tea now we saw that cut is a stimulant drug so what is a stimulant stimulants are a class of drugs that speed up the messages between the brain and the body they make a person feel more awake alert confident or energetic and some of the commonly used stimulants are amphetamines cocaine nicotine synthetic catinin etc now coming back to cut leaves now these leaves of the small tree are chewed by millions worldwide as a mild amphetamine like psychostimulant drug now the chewing of these leaves helps achieve a state of euphoria that is extreme happiness and excitement and it also causes stimulation but in recent years this has left an impact on the health and social aspects of african countries see these leaves are either chewed or even they are dried and used as a tea or uh, they are made into chewable paste or they are sometimes even smoked and sprinkled on food also and their primary active constituent is uh, catenin we saw that catenin is a stimulant and then another uh, main stimulant which it contains is catenin Now we saw that it has impacts on health and social aspects see the regular use of this cut leaves results in manic behavior with delusions its chronic use can cause depression and suicide tendencies also along with hallucinations paranoia etc it can also cause the increase in blood pressure and increase in heart rate and it can even cause several cardiac complications and note that cut leaves are prohibited under the narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act of 1985 it is because as we just saw it contains a uh, catenin and catenin these two are the psychotropic substances prohibited under this act so these leaves contains uh, the substances hence it is also banned so now let us see about the ndps act it is an act to consolidate and amend the laws relating to narcotic drugs and to make stringent provisions for the control and regulation of operations relating to narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances now under the act center may appoint a narcotics commissioner who shall exercise all powers and shall perform all functions relating to the superintendence of cultivation of opium poppy and production of opium also know that under the act center may constitute the narcotics drugs and psychotropic substances consultative committees and these committees shall consist of a chairman and not more than 20 members it also provides for the establishment of national fund for control of drug abuse and this fund will be used for uh, combating illicit traffic in ndps it will also be used for identifying treating rehabilitating addicts and also for preventing drug abuse etc now other than the substances which we saw that are prohibited under the ndps act some other substances which are banned under ndps include opium morphine heroin hashish cocaine lsd etc so that is all about this discussion now let's move on to the next one Our next discussion is based on this news article which talks about the contributions of a woman in getting the facilities that is needed for a village which is predominantly inhabited by Irula community. So let us see about Irula community today. Irulas are a tribe and they have origin from Southeast Asia and Australia. They speak Irula language that is closely related to Dravidian languages like Kannada and Tamil and they also speak 
தமிழ் and mostly they inhabit in the northern tamil nadu and parts of kerala and karnataka especially in tamil nadu they are majorly found in chengalpattu district north arcot and south arcot districts which are not far from the chennai city but it is only the nilgiri irulas who are considered mainly they live in the nilgiri district which is in the extreme northwestern tamil nadu and it is adjacent to the kanthu district of tamil nadu and the nilgiri irulas are also found in karnataka and kerala states now their traditional occupation is usually snake catching and rat catching but however due to depletion of forest they are falling out of jobs and they are increasingly becoming laborers of agriculture i note that they are considered scheduled tribes and irulas are among the 75 particularly vulnerable tribal group and they have been given the pvtg status in tamil nadu only not in kerala or karnataka but only in tamil nadu as you know pvtgs are the marginalized section of the scheduled tribes of india and they are relatively isolated they are educationally and socio economically backward and they live in a habitat that is far away from amenities and note that pvtg is not a constitutional category and they are also not constitutionally recognized communities but it is the government of india's classification which is created with the purpose of enabling improvement in the conditions of certain communities that are with particularly low development and we also saw about pvtgs on our 20th april discussion you can view that analysis for knowing about the criteria based on which pvtgs are identified in our country So these are some of the points that is know about Irula community. Now let's move to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this editorial article which is based on Panchayati Raj institutions and it has been written because April 24th that is today is celebrated as the Panchayat Raj day. So in this editorial author talks about the significance of strong local bodies then issues plaguing the local bodies and also the solutions for these issues so now let us discuss these aspects now the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference now the author of this editorial discusses about a rough timeline of local governance formation So according to the author the cholas were the pioneers in the formation of local bodies the cholas had a well organized hierarchy to oversee the implementation of progressive plans and the local bodies played a crucial role in the implementation of these plans and according to the author in the modern india time period the madras local boards act of 1884 paved the way for local bodies formation see this act was passed by the britishers to form local bodies in both small towns and big cities and they began to appoint members to ensure their better administration and to certain extent the local bodies created through this act brought about positive changes in the basic parameters such as health and hygiene So the local bodies formation went through various ups and downs after that both in british period as well as in the independent india the local bodies struggled to find its proper place after a lot of hurdles and deliberations it was only in the 1990s that the panchayati raj law came into force with the 73rd constitutional amendment act see this constitution 73rd amendment act was passed in the year 1992 and it came into effect on this day in 1993 that is on 24th april 1993 this act empowered the state governments to take the necessary steps that would lead to the formation of the gram panchayats and to help them operate as units of self governance see this act brought massive turning points into our governance because it was the reason for initiation of uh, gram sabhas it also paved the way for the reservation for the downtrodden sections of people and the reservation for women in local bodies and it also led to the formation of state election commissions and state finance commissions so the positive changes brought by this law are immeasurable and significant now here we should not forget about the concept of municipality this got constitutional backing during the same period but through a different amendment that is the 74th constitutional amendment act of 1992 see based on this act the regions which were better equipped with basic facilities and which were more developed than the villages were brought under one coordinated body called as the municipality apart from this the district capitals were also brought under one coordinated body called as the corporation so thus these two acts that is the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment act transferred administration from the politicians and other officials to the people 
So now what are the merits of these local bodies? See, the local bodies can easily solve the trivial and resolvable issues without the assistance of the state governments or even the central government. So this saves a lot of time and resources. Also, these local bodies can be convened as and when the necessary arises. So it helps in the speedy and efficient delivery of services. Then the local bodies have uh, mainly facilitated and paved the way for decentralization in our country. And this has been done by taking democracy to the grassroots levels by involving people in the decision making about their local problems. Then these local bodies have also empowered the backward sections of society and even women by stipulating reservations for them in the elected bodies as we already saw. In addition to this, they also bring about transparency and accountability in governance. And finally, the local bodies also give life to the Gandhian principles and vision. See, according to Gandhiji, the voice of the people is the voice of God. The voice of the Panchayat is the voice of the people. So, the Panchayati Raj ensures that the voice of the people are heard loud and clear. But in today's scenario, these local bodies are plagued by tons of issues. And the author talks about the issues in the Tamil Nadu local bodies because he is from Tamil Nadu. So let us take the example of Tamil Nadu to understand the issues that could be found in the local bodies. First, author feels that the Gram Sabhas in Tamil Nadu have become more like auction houses where instead of selecting the right candidate, the posts are given to the highest bidders. Also, in the state, the local bodies did not even make an attempt to seek the opinions and the consensus of the people on significant significant issues that widely have attracted people's protests. For example, eight-line highway project. See, even though the government announced that people's opinions will be considered, but it went ahead and conducted meetings. And in these meetings also, there were poor attendance and poor representation from the people. But even then, government went ahead with the approval of these projects, which are impediments to normal life of the people in the region. Apart from this, in many of these uh, local bodies, women do not find themselves in major administrative roles. So only on paper, women are shown to be considerable force. But in reality, these local bodies are still under the control of few men or the husbands of those women. Also, the constitution is clear in stating that local body elections must be conducted once in five years. But according to the author, the state government keeps postponing the holding of uh, local body elections in Tamil Nadu. So this is breach of Indian constitution. Hence, the author feels that this postponement of election is not only an act of escapism, but it is also a stain on the vision of Mahatma Gandhi. And thus, it is because it deprives people of their basic rights. So, what can be done in this regard? Here, author stresses that the above hurdles can be overcome by following Kerala as an example. See, according to the author, the state of Kerala has been properly allocating funds for the local bodies functioning. And by doing so, the state has ensured the efficiency of administration. Additionally, Kerala also makes sure that only the eligible members are appointed for the appropriate posts in the local bodies. And by this, the state has ensured that it has upheld the spirit of democracy and meritocracy. Now, based on this, author has few suggestions for the state government of Tamil Nadu. We can also consider this as general suggestions. First, the state government of Tamil Nadu needs to take steps to enable the power of administration to panchayats as stated in the constitution. This will only ensure the efficiency of panchayats. Then there is a need to strengthen the Gram Sabhas and also there is a need to hold area Sabhas in cities. See, area Sabha means a body of all the persons who are registered as voters in the electoral rolls pertaining to to any polling station of that area. Then author suggests forming ward committees, then holding online panchayat meetings. Then he has suggested ensuring decent remuneration to the panchayat chiefs and councillors. And finally, most importantly, he has suggested granting the Gram Sabha with the power to revoke appointed members and representatives. So all these suggestions will ensure efficient functioning of the local bodies, especially the Gram Sabhas, and this in turn will contribute to the real growth in the state. So author concludes by saying that we must collectively strengthen the Panchayati Raj system through people's movement. See here author believes that the voices of people will play a huge role in resolving governance issues and these local bodies provide a great platform to hear people's voice and that is why it is important to strengthen them. So these are some of the points that you can take note from this editorial article. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this news article which talks about millets. See, the news is that recently the Karnataka state government has started providing ragi to poor farmers under the public distribution system. 
and this has been done after cutting the quantum of rice that is provided under PDA system. And it is said that the state government is also planning to include jowar under the public distribution system. So this move has received mixed reactions from the people. Some have appreciated this change because millets are valuable source of nutrition, while others have opposed this move because the government has reduced the quantum of rice. So in this discussion today let us learn about millets. See ragi and jowar belong to the category of crops called millets and when it comes to India jowar, bajra and ragi are the important millets that are grown in our country. Now the millets are also known as coarse grains. They have a very high nutritional value. For example, ragi is very rich in iron, calcium and other micronutrients. Now here talking about jowar, it is the third most important food crop with respect to area and production. And this jowar is a rain fed crop that is mostly grown in the moist areas which hardly needs irrigation. Now major jowar producing states are Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. Now you should take note of these points because they are very important from prelims perspective. Now moving on to bajra. See bajra grows very well on uh, sandy soils and shallow black soil and major bajra producing states are Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Gujarat and Haryana. Now next comes ragi. Ragi is a crop of dry regions and it grows well on red soil, black soil, sandy loamy and shallow black soils. Now major ragi producing states are Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, Jharkhand and Arunachal Pradesh. So this was the brief about these three important millets that are grown in our country. See millets are often referred as superfoods because of their nutrition content and its production can be seen as an approach for sustainable growth and a healthy world. Now apart from nutrition it also has multi-dimensional benefits such as they can address the issues related to nutrition security, food system security and farmers welfare. Further many unique features linked with millets make them a suitable crop which is resilient to India's varied agroclimatic conditions. Now citing these factors only the year 2018 has already been declared as the national year of millets and India has now called for declaring the year 2023 as international year of millets. But however in spite of acknowledging the significance of millets as a superfood there is a general perception that millets are poor person's food and because of this many do not include these millets in their diet and they lose these nutritional content. So it is necessary to rebrand the coarse cereals or millets as nutri cereals and it should be promoted for increasing their production and consumption. So that is all about millets. Now let's move to the next discussion. Now this discussion is based on this news article which talks about Villa Cherry Clay Toys. See the news is that GI tag is sought for this popular Villa Cherry Clay Toys and according to officials the application has been received and the scrutiny for providing GI tag will begin soon. So in this slide let us see about GI tag, its significance and also about the clay toys. See GI tag is nothing but a geographical indication tag. It is a sign that is used on products that have a specific geographical origin and these products possess the qualities or reputations due to that origin only. Now this GI tag in India is governed by the geographical indications of goods registration and protection act of 1999 and it is issued by the geographical indications registry that is situated at Chennai and note that this tag will last up to a term of 10 years only. So after 10 years it has to be renewed. Now this tag helps in gaining recognition and legal protection for the products. So it helps to boost the sales and exports of such geographically specific products. It also protects counterfeiting of that products because once GA tag is given those products will come with those GA tag only. And remember that the first GA tagged product in India is Darjeeling tea and it gained its label in 2004 to 2005. So now let us see about Villa Cherry clay toys. See these clay toys are made in Madurai district of Tamil Nadu. These toys are unique and exclusive combination of terracotta and glazing work that are done on a special clay. Artisans usually get their clay from a tank near Villa Cherry to make these dolls. And till now the artisans make these dolls by using the molds and after that they will paint these dolls with hand. Now the current business volume of these toys is found to be around 15 crore rupees. I know that they are also exported to USA, Germany, Malaysia, Singapore etc. So now geographical indication tag is sought for this Villa Cherry toys. 
to maintain its uniqueness and to save the business now know that many other toys have got uh, geographical indication in our country like uh, chennapatna toys and dolls of karnataka then kondapalli bommalu of andhra pradesh then nirmal toys and crafts of telangana and then uh, we have leather toys of indore which has got gi tag then even the tanjavur doll of tamil nadu has got gi tag so that is all you need to know about geographical indications tag now let's move on to the next discussion our next discussion is about ways and means advances scheme of rbi that is the wma scheme see the news is that rbi has decided to continue with the existing interim wma scheme for all states and uts till september 2021 so today let us first understand about wma and then we'll see what is the news in detail the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference see in order to deal with the covid-19 pandemic rbi had come up with several measures and one of them was to review the limits of wma of states and uts so what is this wma it is provided under the rbi act of 1930 4 under the section 17 clause 5 of this act rbi provides ways and means advances to the states that are banking with it now this is to help those states or uts to tide over temporary mismatches in the cash flow of their receipts and payments in simple words wma is a facility for both the center and states to borrow from the rbi for meeting temporary cash mismatches so they are temporary advances now under the act such advances are repayable in each case not later than 3 months from the date of making that advance that means wma loans or advances have 3 month tenure so through wma rbi acts as the debt manager for state governments since they are intended to provide a cushion to the states to carry on with their essential activities and normal financial operations to know that there are two types of wma one is normal wma and second one is special wma normal wma are clean advances but special wma are secured advances that are provided against the pledge of the government of india dated securities see there is no statutory provision regarding the maximum amount of the advance or the rate of interest that is to be charged on that advance therefore these matters are regulated by the respective agreements or arrangements which the rbi has made with the central government and with the state governments so according to the existing arrangements the operative limit for special wma for a state is subject to its holdings of the central government dated securities up to a maximum sanctioned limit Additionally RBI has also determined that the limits for normal and special WMA for each state shall be the multiples of the prescribed minimum balance that is required to be maintained by that state with the RBI and these limits are revised periodically and some sources say according to RBI rules the normal WMA limits are based on a 3 year average of a state's actual revenue and capital expenditure so now what about the interest rate on WMA say as per the existing arrangements the interest rate on WMA is the RBI's repo rate as you know repo rate is basically the rate at which RBI lends short term money to the banks here you should also know about one important thing that is the governments are also allowed to draw amounts in excess of their wma limits and this is called as overdraft so the interest on such overdraft is 2 percentage points above the repo rate so for example if the repo rate is 4 percentage then for overdraft the interest rate will be 6 percentage and here note that no state can run an overdraft with the rbi for more than a certain period now here we should note about the overdraft regulation scheme of 1985 under this no state was allowed to run an overdraft with the rbi for more than 7 continuous working days now in case an overdraft appeared in the state's accounts and then it remained even beyond 7 continuous working days then the rbi and its agencies stopped the payments on behalf of the state but note that this 7 days limit was increased in 1993 and it was increased to 10 consecutive working days so the time limit for clearance of overdraft is now 10 consecutive working days so now what is the news see the news is regarding increasing the aggregate wma limit and to continue with the existing interim wma limit till september 2021 see to tackle the pandemic government took two initiatives regarding wma the first initiative was that it allowed an increased wma limit see we saw that the wma limits are revised 
so there was a wma limit that was being continued but to tackle the pandemic there was a increase in wma limit provided by the rbi and this was called as the interim wma limit now today's news is that rbi has decided to continue this existing interim wma limit up to september 30 2021 and this limit is currently at uh, 51560 crore rupees now the second initiative is regarding the review of wma limits for state governments and union territories now for this purpose in 2020 itself rbi constituted an advisory committee under the chairmanship of shri sudhir shivatsava so for this now the committee has given its recommendations which have been agreed by the rbi and this is the another news the committee had recommended 46 percentage increase in aggregate wma limit see previously the aggregate wma limit was fixed in february 2016 and it was at uh, 32225 crore rupees and now it has been increased so the overall revised limit is at 47010 crore rupees and this is for all the states So these are the two important news regarding WMA. Now here you should note that the interim WMA are temporary relaxations and they are expected to help the states. It is because the lockdown has resulted in drying up of revenues. Along with this the economic activity was at a near standstill. So there was hardly any money coming in from GST, petroleum products, liquor, motor vehicles, stamp duty, registration fee etc. So there was no revenue at all. and at the same time states were also incurring the costs that are involved in combating the novel corona virus so now by continuing the existing interim wma and by increasing the aggregate wma limits it will allow the states to meet the targeted expenditure commitments in the absence of revenue flows in a situation where there is resurgence of the pandemic so these are some of the points that you should know about the news regarding wma limits now let's move on to the next discussion Now we have come to the last session the practice questions discussion session now this first question is a pair based question on one side handicrafts are given and on the other side the state which they belong to is given first pair is chennapatna dolls karnataka now this is a correct pair now the second pair is nirmal toys assam now this is incorrect pair because nirmal toys and crafts is originally from telangana and not from assam now the third pair is tanjavur doll tamil nadu and this is also a correct pair And here the question asks for the correctly matched pairs. So the correct answer is option A, one and three only. And remember that all these toys and dolls have geographical indication tag in these states. Now this next question is a two statement question. First statement is depreciation of Indian rupee may help increase India's exports. Now this statement is correct. because depreciation of indian rupee leads to a rise in exports here importers from other countries would be able to get more products from india for the same expenditure in dollars and that is why exports will increase now the second statement is a high current account deficit for india can lead to depreciation of indian rupee now this statement is also correct because current account deficit takes place when the import bill is greater than the export bill and this leads to an adverse balance of payments so it implies that india would have to pay more foreign exchange than what it will earn so as a result of this india's demand for foreign currency would increase and thereby it will lead to depreciation of indian rupee itself and here the question asks for the incorrect statements but both the statements are correct so the correct answer is option d neither one nor two Now this next question asks cut leaves is a stimulant drug made from the leaves and twigs of an evergreen shrub it is mainly cultivated in horn of africa and middle east south america south asia eastern europe see during discussion we saw that the cut leaves are mainly cultivated in east africa and south yemen so that means the correct answer should be horn of africa and middle east because horn of africa is in the east of africa and south yemen that is yemen is in the middle east only so here relevant correct answer is option a now this next question is based on ways and means advances first statement asks it is a temporary mechanism under the reserve bank of india act to help state governments to get over mismatches in the cash flow of their receipts and payments now this statement is correct we saw this during discussion second statement is the wma borrowed by a state government is repayable in each case not later seven working days from the date of making that advance 
This statement is incorrect because according to section 17 clause 5 of RBI Act, this period is 3 months and not 7 working days. And here the question asks for the correct statements, so the correct answer is option A, one only. Now this next question is based on copper smelting. First statement is copper smelting is the process through which the copper ore is purified through intense heating and melting to derive high quality copper and copper products. This statement is correct. This is the correct definition of copper smelting. And here smelting is a process by which a metal is obtained from its ore by heating beyond the melting point. And this is done in the presence of oxidizing agents like air or reducing agents such as coke. Now the second statement is it releases sulfur dioxide and air pollutant. Now this statement is also correct because most copper ores are sulfur based and therefore when they are smelted they release sulfur dioxide into the air which has the potential to cause harmful effects. And here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option C both 1 and 2 since both the statements are correct. Now this next question is based on hailstones. They are raindrops frozen after they fall into the ground. Now this statement is incorrect because as we saw hailstones are not frozen raindrops because frozen rain falls as water and it freezes as it nears the ground. But hail actually falls as a solid only. Now the second statement is they are typical in equatorial regions. This statement is also incorrect because large damaging hails fall most frequently in uh, continental areas of middle latitudes like the US and the northern India, but it is rare in equatorial regions. And here the question asks for the correct statements, but both the statements are incorrect. So the correct answer is option D, neither one nor two. Now let us take one main question based on GS paper 2. This question is about local bodies. You can answer this question in 250 words and post it in the comment section. With this we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis and the practice questions discussion session. If you like the video, don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation. Mm -hmm.